Hello everyone, I'm Allison Steinberg and welcome to In Focus. We begin with the countdown to the critical 2024 presidential election. The latest polling shows the current occupant of the White House in a dead heat with the leading GOP candidate, Donald Trump. The survey released Wednesday by Quinnipiac focuses on the important swing state of Pennsylvania. It shows Trump with a razor-thin lead over Biden, Trump garnering 47 percent support, to Biden's 46 percent among registered voters in the Keystone state. It should come as no surprise that Team Biden is once again furiously spinning the facts, making excuses for Scranton Joe's dwindling support in his home state. Most people are quick to point out it's the economy, stupid. Consistently, the, the president's approval rating for economic issues is underwater, and lately it's been below 40 percent. So uh, do they, I, I mean, I, I don't think you'd say that they don't know how they feel about things or that they're incorrect in, in feeling concern or, or feeling like uh, they're having trouble making ends meet because of inflation. You, you, you would identify with them, but do, do, how come they don't seem to be clued in on, on all the great things that, that are happening? Well, and I, I was, I did not say that, um, I mean, certainly when we're looking at polls uh, and we're understanding how people feel, the place that I always start is the fact that the vast majority of Americans get the vast majority of their income from holding down a job. That provides the economic security for them and their families. And that is one of the reasons that the president prioritized getting the back, economy back on track and getting people back into jobs. Perhaps what America needs the most at this critical time is a fresh perspective from a political outsider. A candidate with a vision to battle back against big government, drain the swamp, clean up our streets, and unify our nation. Republican candidate Vivek Ramaswamy believes he is the man for the job. I think we are just a little young as a nation, going through our own version of adolescence, figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And when, when you see it that way, at least for me, when I see it that way, it starts to make sense. Because when you go through adolescence, you go through an identity crisis. We're 250 years into this. Rome lasted 2,000 years, if you include the second half of the Eastern Roman Empire as well. We're 250 years in, so even if we're destined to be Rome, we're in the early innings. We're going through our adolescence. Yes, the U.S. president can actually make a difference. I believe there's one executive branch, not two. I will run the executive branch accordingly. It will take someone, an outsider like me, maybe even of a different generation, to make this happen, but I genuinely believe it deep in my bones that it is possible. I believe I have probably among people who have run in the last 30 years, maybe save for yourself, but I feel it this way, probably one of the most deep understandings of how to actually shut down the administrative state on strong legal and constitutional authority. And joining me now with his vision for the future of America is 2024 Republican candidate for President of the United States, Vivek Ramaswamy. Thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure to have you. It's good to be on. How are you? Great. Thank you so much. So, Vivek, lay it out for us. If you were to be elected, what's first on your list of to-dos? There's obviously a lot of work to be done. So tell us where you'd start. Key priorities start with shutting down the regulatory state, the three-letter government agencies in Washington, D.C. I think the U.S. president is constitutionally empowered to shut down the agencies that should not exist. The Department of Education, where the federal government should have no role. The FBI, which has become so corrupt and politicized, and its functions could be performed by the U.S. Marshals. Go down the list and actually make sure that we have, once again, three branches of government in this country, not four. Second thing I'm focused on from a foreign policy perspective is end the war in Ukraine and at the same time declare economic independence from communist China. Today, we are dependent on our enemy for our modern way of life. That's not sustainable for America. And I think we need to think on the time scales of history to cut the cord. And along the way, I think one of the things that's my responsibility is the first millennial ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. I think it's my particular responsibility to revive national pride in the next generation of Americans so that young Americans, by the time I'm done, are once again proud to be citizens of this nation. That's the hallmark of my vision. That much I can commit to, that when I leave office in January 2033 and I'm addressing the American people, I will tell you we accomplished those three things. Well, that certainly sounds like a great start to all things that our country desperately needs. 
You also recently announced that if you were to win the election, you would free former American intelligence contractor Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. You also said you would pardon President Donald Trump, who, of course, is now facing bogus federal criminal charges from his handling of classified documents. How would you ensure that this actually does happen? By winning the election. That's what I would say. Many presidents wait until their final days to issue their pardons because they don't want to deal with the political backlash of it. And rarely do they pre-specify specific cases where they will issue a pardon. I've done the opposite of that with from Julian Assange to Edward Snowden to Donald Trump to many others. We have a list. I've said that on day one, January 20th, 2025, when I take office, they will be free men. And I think the reason why is we cannot have two standards of justice in this country. One for Antifa, a different for peaceful protesters of a different political persuasion. We've had two standards of justice in an imperfect past as our, in our history as a country. Black people in 1870 did not enjoy full protection under the law. Back then, it was on the basis of race. Today, it's on the basis of political belief. And I think that whether it's on the basis of race or political belief, we should have one standard of justice that applies to all Americans. That's what I'm committed to deliver. And the reason I want to do it is this will allow us to move forward as a country. We have made some grave mistakes in the last four years. But in order to move forward, we have to go back and correct those mistakes. That's why I've committed to issue those pardons or commutation of sentences. Very well. Thank you for that. Now, Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. just told News Nation in a town hall that he would uh, sign an assault weapons ban if he were to be elected. He says the Second Amendment is settled and that he would not take anyone's guns, though it seems to me a ban would infringe upon the right he said was settled. Uh, It kind of seems like he's playing both sides here, but what's your stance on the issue? I agree with you on that. I think the Second Amendment is the one amendment that protects all of the others. Look at my speech to the NRA earlier this year where I reviewed the history of this. The reason that China and Iran offer all of the other rights that we offer in our Bill of Rights, but don't actually secure them for their people, is they don't have a Second Amendment. So we have to remember that in this country. The Second Amendment exists for a reason. The other thing about an assault weapons ban is people who don't understand this issue fail to miss this fact is it's just virtue signaling. What is an assault weapons? It's even ill-defined. This is something that just makes the people who actually pass the laws feel good about themselves or signal their virtue to mainstream media instead of actually getting to the essence of what they're actually doing. So I believe in the Second Amendment. I do think that we have a problem in this country that we need to deal with in the form of the mental health epidemic. As a parent, I cannot tolerate the idea of yet another school shooting ever happening again in this country. The way we address that is protect our children, put armed security guards in our schools to protect our most valuable national asset, address the mental health epidemic upstream, the fatherlessness crisis in this country, Nearly every major perpetrator of a mass shooting in the last number of years grew up in a fatherless household. Let's have the courage to step up and fix those problems rather than just signaling our virtue by checking a box on a simple assault weapons ban or something else that makes the mainstream media feel better about themselves. And I think that's definitely one of the areas where I disagree with RFK. Absolutely. Thank you for explaining that. Since we're on the topic of firearms, a few months back, former CNN host Don Lemon tried to shut you up on air after you educated him on the Second Amendment. He was going on about some racist propaganda and you properly dismantled his argument with facts. Well, now it seems the former CNN host has nothing better to do but to try to continue to smear you. Let's go ahead and take a look at his recent comments. I don't believe in platforming liars and bigots and, um, you know, insurrectionists and election deniers and putting them on the same footing as people who are telling the truth, people who are fighting for what's right, people who are abiding by the Constitution. I think that would be a dereliction of journalistic duties to do those sorts of things. That is what has gotten me to this point, and that is what is going to carry me forward. So now platforming people like you is a dereliction of journalistic duty, which is just straight comedy coming from Don. Vivek, what's your reaction here? Just one more example of what the other side does when they lose the debate. I educated Don Lemon on history that he wasn't aware of. Part of the reason that actually the Dred Scott case was decided the way it was, which said ignominiously that black people could not be citizens before the Civil War, was that it would allow black people to own guns. 
The black codes that were passed after the Civil War were designed to actually stop black people from enjoying their freedoms after the Civil War. I was teaching him that our own history teaches us the Second Amendment is required for civil rights. That made his head explode on set because for him, Second Amendment is bad, but civil rights are good, so the two couldn't mix. And he told me that I could only disagree with him when I had black skin. Well, I think that that was pretty embarrassing for him, and I think CNN made the decision under at least its former CEO, who has since been fired as well, to fire Don Lemon. Now, the interesting thing is that Don Lemon is now ratcheting this up and calling me a bigot and an insurrectionist for making an argument about American history. I think we need to move beyond the name calling, get back to the substance. That's what I'm doing. And that's also why I talk to everybody. I talk to you all, but I'll also go to NBC or CNN. I'm not running to just lead a political party. I'm running to lead a nation. And that means we talk to everyone and bring the truth and the arguments with us. I think we're on the winning side, so we shouldn't apologize for it. Absolutely. Well, I certainly appreciate that you have the bravery to go over to the other side. I think it's very important to unite us all at this time. That's what we need more than anything. Uh, now, one of the greatest threats I think our nation faces is that of the unelected globalist leaders who are trying to dictate and control every aspect of our lives. The World Economic Forum is currently conducting their 14th annual meeting, which is happening now in China. Let's go ahead and take a listen to a recent clip from the meeting from WEF founder Klaus Schwab. History is truly at a turning point. Global energy systems, food systems and supply chains will be deeply affected. In times of crisis, the role of governments is more important and more relevant than ever. The profound challenges to mankind, such as climate change, are globally interconnected and require collaborative responses. Vivek, it seems to me the World Economic Forum and global elites are looking to grant governments more authoritarian powers over the lives of everyday people in response to the manufactured crises that they themselves create. The World Economic Forum and the UN tell us directly they want their sustainable development goals met by 2030, which I think is just an opportunity for them to exploit the imaginary climate emergency to ultimately replace national sovereignty and representative democracy with the one world government they openly tell us they plan to implement. How big of a threat do you think this is to us and do you have any plans to address this? I think it's a grave threat to the right word you used, our sovereignty. We fought an American revolution to say that we the people decide how actually we rule ourselves. Whether it's climate change or racial justice, we settle those questions through our constitutional republic, through free speech and open debate in the public square where every vote counts equally. Not based on an autocrat or a monarch on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean deciding behind closed doors in a palace hall or the mountaintops of Davos how we live our lives. And so one of the things I'm going to do as U.S. president is I will stop funding the organizations that are trying to reassert transnational control over the United States. The WHO. I think the U.N. has outlived its purpose. We have to take a look one by one at these international agencies. The World Economic Forum is just another example of this same trend. We have to take a look at that managerial class at the international level. So just as I've said, as I would shut down those government agencies domestically, the three-letter agencies that from the Department of Education to the FBI to the ATF and so on, I'll do the same thing internationally to a lot of the managerial class international institutions that have, should have either never existed or have long outlived their purpose. That is how I'll lead this nation. And mark my words, that will take an outsider. An existing politician will not get that job done, especially if they're beholden to mega donor interests in this country. The thing about my campaign is I never asked a donor for permission to run. I did not take a hat in hand and a tin can asking them for money from the mega donor class before I ran. Instead, I put an eight-figure sum of my own hard-earned money. I live the American dream. That's how we declare independence from the donor class, but we also need to declare independence from the monarchs who try to rule the United States from abroad, and I say no to that vision. Great point. I love that. Uh, before we let you go, Vivek, uh, given all that we know about election interference and everything we endured over the past election, do you think we still have a fair shot at free and fair elections? Are you hopeful that someone like yourself could actually win this, knowing that elections have become more of selections in the current age? 
I think for many reasons, it is important that we deliver a landslide election this time around. I do not think a 50.1 margin will get the job done. I think that that's a big part of why I'm in this race. As I said, I'm the first millennial ever to run for president as a Republican. I'm reaching voters in places like the south side of Chicago or Kensington in Philadelphia, where we visited, where traditional Republicans don't go. That's not optional. It's not a nice to have. It is a must have in order for us to actually secure a meaningful victory in this election. I'll tell you about election interference. Microsoft owned LinkedIn already censored my account as a presidential candidate once for speaking the truth about a lot of the climate agenda and the international ESG agenda, all grounded in fact. But what I like to do is I like to show up and actually win. So I posted the actual email traffic that they had telling us that this violated their policies on misinformation and hate speech and violence. Ask, actually proven that the points I said were well-founded in fact. They then had to sheepishly apologize. That's how we show up on the other side's turf and win. But I think if that Hunter Biden laptop story had not been suppressed by social media companies last time around, it's very likely we would have had a very different result in the election. Big tech interference is the top threat to this upcoming election. I will not stand by and watch idly. I will fight for what is right through the marketplace of ideas with actually expressing my views unapologetically. But I think it's also important that we deliver a moral mandate, a landslide like what Reagan delivered in 1980. That's what I believe I will deliver in 2024, and it's why I'm in this race. Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you so much for joining us today, and best of luck to you. Thank you.